uh, called Live Sin. And it's been exciting to, to go through what it means to be a people of God that aren't just here gathered on Sunday morning, but are people that are sent with the message that God has changed my life and He can change your life. We opened the first uh, message was all about the gospel, that there is, there is hope for everybody in every situation, and that name, the hope that there is, is Jesus. And so if you, if you haven't listened to that first message, I encourage you to go back. It's on our website, capcitychurch.org, where we can find, go ahead, Richard, you can come on. It's good. I can edit that out of the video there. No. <laughs> um, but uh, the, first, the, the first series there was all about the gospel, the power of the gospel to change our lives. And Jesus makes a statement. He says, freely you have received, now freely give. So what he has done in us, God desires to do through us. And that's what this whole series is going to be about, living sin. The gospel that has changed our lives is the same gospel that is for our neighbors, our co-workers, our families, and our brothers and sisters. This is last week, we begin to talk about how do we speak the gospel. If we are sick people, then we've got to be able to communicate the gospel. And so we went over the story of God and how there's a four-part story that, that God has created in each one of our lives. That we have all been created with an identity. There's a fall in our life. There's a, there's a way that our, our lives have, have fallen short of what God has desired for us. But God comes in, He redeems our lives, and He brings a restoration. He brings a new hope in our life. And as we begin to rehearse that story and understand what God has done in us, it's easy for us then to communicate that story of what God is. So we make Jesus the hero of our story as we're talking with our coworkers, our families, our neighbors, and our brothers and sisters. And so we want to continue in this series to live sin and to see how God has designed our home and specifically the dinner table to be a place that is an invitation for others to experience the grace of God, to experience the gospel. And so this morning, that's what we're going to talk about, living sent, using our dinner table as a place for the gospel. So can we pray this morning and ask that God would uh, speak to us and that we would hear what he would have to say? Father, we're so grateful that you have gathered us here today. We're so grateful that you have honored us with the gift of your spirit, that your spirit comes and he speaks truth to us. So, Father, I pray that our hearts would be open, that our ears would be open to hear exactly what you would have for us. God, I know, God, that when you speak, God, it has a power to change our life. It has a power to encourage us. It has a power to uplift us. So, Father, Lord, we pray that those things would be evident in today's gathering. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I think if I went around the room and I, I surveyed most of us, we would say, you know, I, I really want to be like Jesus. I, I, that's a desire of my heart. Even as a young kid growing up in a, a church family, I think maybe that, that might have something to do with it. But I always saw Jesus as somebody that I would love to emulate. I, I would love to, to look like him. The things that he did, the, the miracles that I read about, the stories I heard in Sunday school and in kids' church, and, and I would love my life to be like that. Uh, I didn't really consider, you know, the fact that he, he didn't have any place to lay his head. You know, that maybe maybe it wasn't that maybe it wasn't it wasn't something that I always thought about. But all of these these life things, he was always interacting with people, impacting people. People came to, to listen to him. And people came from afar and wanted to be close to him. Like, wow, the power that he had in his life, that's something I desired. And as I was studying and I looked through the book of Luke, I found that many times in the book of Luke, Jesus was either going to a meal, at a meal, or traveling to a meal. And I said, you know what? I really want to be like Jesus. I mean, I get to eat. This. I can be like Jesus while I'm eating. But if, uh, let's, let's turn here to Luke chapter 5. And we're going to look a little bit at, at Jesus and how he ate and see that in our homes we have a powerful place to share the gospel. And that's around our dinner table. Eating food with people is a great way to share and have a demonstration of the gospel of Jesus. So we're in Luke chapter 5. And we're going to look at the verse 27 through 31. Luke chapter 5, verse 27. It says this. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to the, their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors? Jesus answered them, It is not 
the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And verse 33 says this, They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. I said, so to be a good disciple of Jesus, i got to go on eating and drinking. I said, come on, I can, I can do that. If I want to be like Jesus, if we want to be like Jesus, we've got to go on eating and drinking. Yeah. It's actually around the table that Jesus did evangelism and discipleship. Around the table is where he taught, and, and we'll, we'll learn today that around the table is the greatest place to do theology. So let's look at let's look at a few things this morning. We saw, as I mentioned, Jesus was always going around eating. If you if you survey the book of Luke, and you can take notes if you want, but in Luke five we see here, right? He's eating with tax collector and, and others at the home of Levi. But then in, in Luke seven, uh, Jesus is also anointed. Remember the woman who comes and anoints his feet. That's also at a meal at Simon the Pharisee's house. They're they're eating a meal. In Luke chapter nine. Jesus feeds 5,000 people, a miracle, a spreading of, of, of the food that he had. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus eats with Mary and Martha, right, remember? And, and, and they get a little bit upset who's sitting at Jesus' feet and who's working, he should be yeah. working and doing all this thing. But it was all centered around a meal. In Luke 11, uh, Jesus condemns the Pharisees and the teachers, and guess what? It's right in the middle of a big meal. And in Luke chapter 14, uh, Jesus sees this, and he, and he tells the, the people that you shouldn't invite your, your family and your friends. You should actually invite the poor and the needy and, and those who actually can't repay you. Those, those are the people you should be eating with. And in Luke 19, uh, Jesus invites himself to dinner with Zacchaeus. And this is a great thing. If you guys if you guys don't get it, sometimes it's okay to invite yourself over for dinner. I would do that a lot when I was, uh, some of you know, I was uh, doing campus ministry. And even around in, in my neighborhood, I lived in Sheboygan Avenue, a whole bunch of apartment complexes. And I get to meet people from all around the world. It's, it's really fun. And, and I like to eat food anyway and, and try new things. And so I, I meet my uh, Indian friends. And I'm like, I've never had a good curry dish or, or, or when I first started doing this. And I said, could you make me some curry? Said, I would love to have you over for curry. Yeah, come on over. And, and, and then I, I just met a Chinese friend that I've been talking to at work. I, I also work at Curry the Lock full time. And so he said, my wife makes really good Chinese food. I said, can I come over? I love Chinese food. And, and so I'm just, I'm just following Jesus' example here. Jesus, he invited himself over for dinner. It's okay if we're going to have meals, we're going to get to know people, if we're going to be uh, people that are, are lived, sent like Jesus, hey, invite yourself over for dinner. Have some dinners with some friends. All right, let's look, continue looking here. So that's uh, Luke chapter 19. Uh, and Luke chapter 22 uh, is, a, is a, a story of the Last Supper. Jesus eating with his disciples. It's an important moment where he's sharing the, the bread that was broken, representing his body, the, the blood that was shed, the drink that they had, and remembrance. And he said, do this as often, and, and remember for me. It's a big meal. It's a big party. And we, we talk about how the early church used to celebrate communion. They had a feast. I mean, they had, they had whole tables full of food. And that's how they celebrated the last supper, the Lord's, the Lord's meal. In Luke chapter 24, Again, Jesus reveals himself to the disciples, and he has fish with uh, the two disciples from Emmaus. And, and then later, with all of his disciples, he's on the shoreline. He eats some fish, and, and we know we talked about that, that demonstration that he was real, that he had a real body that was resurrection, uh, resurrected. And, and, and that was so, to say to the disciples, not only, hey, I'm real, but there's a hope for you, that there's a future resurrection that's greater than just a spiritual floating in the clouds like angels, but no, a real body that we receive. So meals are important to Jesus. And I said, you know what, meals are important to him. I hope they'd be important to us. As a set people, how can we use meals to share the gospel? So yeah, we see here, he's always coming, either, either going to at a meal or coming, coming to or from a meal. Uh, so in, in Luke chapter 14, let's turn there, he refers to the kingdom of God uh, like a banquet. And there's a parable of this a great banquet. And it says this in 
Luke chapter 14, verse 16. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had invited to come. Everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought a five yoke of oxen and I have to wait to, to try them. Please excuse me. Still another said, I, I just got married, so I, I can't come. The servant came back and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and off ordered his servants, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys and to the towns and bring the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what are you ordered has already been done, but there is still more room. In verse 23, the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. And so hey, here we, we see this, this great feast that's been prepared for us. We talked about last week that anybody who calls the name of the Lord, they will be saved. They will receive the blessings of heaven. There's a blessing that God has prepared for us, and He's invited those of us to come and join Him. Come and join in a meal. Uh, I love meals because they, they, there's a sign, especially in, in some countries, maybe not so much here in America, that there's a sign of prosperity, that depending on the spread that you're able to provide, right? And, and here in, in this banquet setting, we see that a great banquet had been spread out, a great wealth had been spread out, and now the, the invitation is for anybody who would come. And though sometimes I find myself in the same place, some of these, they, they made excuses of why they, they couldn't come, right? And you know what? The master said, hey, get more people. They're, they're, go to the furthest reaches of the city. Go to the furthest reaches of the country. And, and just compel them to be here because this is the, the best place for them. Isn't the meal a, a, a picture of heaven? In Luke chapter 15, it, it talked about the prodigal son. And you know that the the... the, the Epitome, the, the, the starting point of the son's turn back towards the father. It was when he realized that he desired to eat the pig's meal over what he could have ate at his father's house. So, so meal is, is, is a place of blessing. Meal is a place of provision. The meals is a representation, I believe, of the God, of the grace of God in our lives. So when we gather around a meal time, man, it's, it's a time of Thanksgiving. It, it's not just a time of, oh God, hey, you know, we got those short prayers, right? Who, who's with me too, right? You got the short prayers, oh God bless it, thank you for this food, I know I have to do this, amen, and then, and then I partake. But no, uh, the, the meal time, the blessing around the meal time is, wow, it's a grace of God. It's, a, it's the tangible expression of God's blessing in our life, that he provided me a job, that I could pay for my bills, that I could gather this food, and I could have this time around the plate. That it, it's a tangible expression of God's blessing and God's evidence in our lives. Meal times are awesome. By the end of the service, we'll be convinced of this. All right. So, <laughs> so Luke describes Jesus and describes his ministry strategy. What is Jesus' ministry strategy described in Luke? I'll sum it up this way. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. It wasn't, it wasn't the Son of Man came and he held great big crusades. It wasn't the, the Son of Man came and he, he did a whole bunch of miracles. So the miracles are recorded there. The, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Yeah. And that was Jesus' ministry strategy. I want to get in people's houses. I want to have people over. I want to entertain people. I, I want to be around them in their everyday life. Sometimes in church, we, we tend to push a uh, specialized ministry and kind of highlight specialized ministry. And, you know, here on Sunday morning, you, know, you have one person speaking on a Sunday morning, you know, and, and so sometimes in our mind we think, oh, I, I can't do that, or, or hey, there's, there's certain particular people that we have that, that come down and pray for people during, during altar time, or we have certain people that, that lead worship, and, you know, hey, maybe I don't have that gift, or I have that talent, and, and sometimes I believe we, we've specialized ministry in such a way that it's, it's removed us from the ordinary things that Jesus did. Eating a meal is something ordinary that all of us can do, and when we get an understanding that in, in doing meals is going to allow me to be just like Jesus, ministry becomes something I can do. Sharing the gospel with somebody becomes something I can do. I can 
cook a meal, whether it's macaroni and cheese because I boil water and melt some cheese on it, or maybe I, 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 I can grill a, grill a steak, or, or maybe I could make something that, that somebody else hasn't tried, and a meal becomes something easy, easy for me to share the gospel with others. Sharing a meal symbolizes friendship. Especially in this time, it was it was a, a, a meal time was, it was something that you shared with the most intimate of people. You wanted to be careful who you had in your home. Uh, you know, it wasn't it wasn't something you just extended an invite to anybody. Uh, when you had an estranged relationship <coughs> with people, a, a meal time was a sign of restoration. Who so come and eat together? It shows a restoring of relationships, and that's what's a beautiful picture of when we think about the gospel, the whole story of the gospel that we have been saved and that. Christ is, is preparing a meal for us. He, he's inviting us into a, a banquet at the end of time that, that we will come and we will eat with them and we will fellowship with them, representing, giving us a picture of our relationship being completely restored. So the first point, I think, or the point that I want to make is eating demonstrates demonstrate the grace of God. Let's turn back now to Luke chapter 5. We're going to focus on these Pharisees and this meal that Jesus had with his, with uh, the Levites, the sinners, and the tax collectors. The Pharisees were always getting upset at Jesus for different things. He wasn't following the rules right. He wasn't following tradition. And, and this was another one of those moments in Luke chapter 5, this story that we read of eating with the Levites, where Jesus wasn't following tradition. And, and the Pharisees got upset about this. So the biggest thing was, was, was that he was switching the, the dietary laws. One, one of the things in the Jewish community that divided them from the Gentiles in the area was how they ate. There's regulations on certain ways that they should wash their hands before meals. And Jesus messed that up because he was touching people and healing people and then eating meals with them. And he said, you're not clean. But there's other things that divided the Jewish people between the, the Gentiles at the time was that there was, um, there was certain foods that they couldn't eat. There's a certain preparation of their food that, that had to happen, and so they couldn't go and attend a, a barbecue at a Gentile's house that it wasn't Jewish because, hey, they didn't know how the meat was going to be prepared. They didn't know how the food was going to be prepared. And, and so all of a sudden, the way that they ate now created a cultural boundary between them and other people. The dietary regulations meant that Jesus couldn't enter intimate relationship with those that he shared meals with, with those that were around him. And so... This Pharisees, that's what they're getting upset about. Man, you, you're, you're becoming intimate with people that, that you shouldn't be, Jesus. Like, this is against our cultural norms. But Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, 6 through 7, he, he mentions that there's going to be a great banquet. But he also mentioned who's going to be at that banquet. Right. And Jesus was aware of this. The people that were going to be at this banquet in Isaiah chapter 25 says that it was going to be all nations that it was going to be all faces, that it was going to be all the earth at this great banquet. So here's the dilemma, right? We see, man, the Pharisees want to uphold this, this uh, cultural uh, norm, but then Jesus says, no, I, I, know, I know the end of the story. I, I know what the demonstration of grace is going to be, that the message of gospel, the message of hope, is going to be for all people, from all backgrounds, from all, the, I guess it's all faces, all the earth is going to be represented at this meal. So Jesus breaking into these into these meals with others, that's what Luke chapter 5 says, right? It was the, the tax collector and others. <laughs> uh, maybe you consider, yeah, I was going to say, maybe you consider yourself an other. Maybe, maybe people have considered you. But no, Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a meal with you. See, many times in our society, and we can even think about too, that those others, those others that we, we don't want in our house, that neighbor that we know is uh, maybe a little bit different than we are. Maybe they, they have some storied past that isn't like my, my past, and so you know, I have to be careful. And one of the times that we had missional community, we invite people into our home every Wednesday night and have a meal and, and study the word. And there's a time where, where somebody was, was starting to come regularly and they were noticing that we had others showing up. So our, our home uh, our home is open on Wednesday night to anybody. It doesn't matter if you if I've seen you before or not. We, we want people in the home. And they said, they said, 
Aren't you worried about your security? Like, do you lock your doors at night? Like, do, what kind of background do you know about everybody that, that's coming in and, and meeting with us? And I said, I, I don't know anything about them. <laughs> why, and they, they, why would you do that? Well, well, Jesus here shows this example. And he went and he ate. And this eating showed a demonstration of the gospel, of how Jesus is with us. And he said, remember the gospel story is this, that we were the enemies of God. Yet he showered us with love. He came and he served us, putting us into a position of sonship and, and daughtership, putting us in a inheritance with him. And this is the gospel message that we received. And if we talk about again what Jesus said to his disciples, freely you have received, freely give it away. See, doing lunch with people is doing theology. Who we eat with, who we surround ourselves with, is a demonstration of our theology. What we believe about who God is and what he's done for us. So when we sit around our, our dinner table and maybe we have nobody else around us. It's just us at, at our dinner table. And it shows that we have, uh, we have taken for granted the fact that God has welcomed all. And sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves, we do want to have a little protection. And maybe I want some time for myself. But aren't you so glad that Jesus didn't just take a little time for himself and, and take a little break and, and, and do it privately? And I know sometimes the call to the gospel, it costs something. And some of us may recognize as we challenge ourselves to live as sent people that it may cost us private time around the table. And now my table will become open for other people to join me. In Luke chapter uh, 11, Jesus is giving instructions about uh, who could come and to be with them at dinner. Luke chapter 11, in the starting in verse 37, it, it's talking that Jesus began to speak and the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. So he went and he reclined at the table, but the Pharisees were surprised and noticed that Jesus did not first wash his hands before the meal. Here's Jesus breaking, breaking another rule. Then 39 says, The Lord said to them, Now, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside of you are full of greed and wickedness. You are foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside clean also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to the Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all kinds of garden herbs, and you neglect the justice and love the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to the Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and respect, respectfully greet in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. One of the experts of the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Hello. Ever, Hello. I get offended. Anybody else get offended by Jesus, what he says sometimes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did it again. You insult us also. Jesus replied, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. But Jesus here, he's getting ready for a meal, and he doesn't wash his hands. And it goes into a deeper teaching about the mealtime. He said, he said, some of you, uh, you, you put so much burdens on other people. You, you, you always want the best thing at your table. You always want the best people at your table. Later in, in Luke, it says, don't invite your family. And it says, don't invite others who can repay you. Yeah. So there's a culture, and they said, you know, I know I could have this person over for dinner because it's going to be better for me. It, it's, going to, it's going to increase my reputation in the land. And so I'm going to make a meal and I'm going to plan a time that I'm going to have the best person over for dinner because, hey, everybody will see that the superstar came and ate with me. They would even invite Jesus because, hey, they know Jesus was popular. Hey, Jesus, come over because we know, hey, Jesus is a popular person. Hey, it's going to be beneficial for my reputation if I have this, uh, this person over for me. 
or they wouldn't allow people that couldn't come to the meal. So they wouldn't allow the poor because the poor didn't have a place to shower, they didn't have a place to get clean. So now even though they could provide for the needs of the poor around them, they couldn't allow them to come in the meal because they would be unclean and it would make the meal unclean. You see these barriers that are all put up around them actually being of the share of blessing that God has given us with those who are around us? Sometimes their expectation of clothing, behavior, literacy, punctuation would exclude the very ones that needed a seat at the table. Yes. And this is what Jesus was getting at. This is like they were just going back and forth with the Pharisees that, hey guys, no, I have come, Jesus has come for all. It's the way you're eating, it's the way you're inviting people, it's the way that you, you have control who enters and who leaves your home. Has, has that become a hindrance from people actually receiving the great blessing of who I am, who Jesus was? So if we are going to be able to be a people that are live sent, what are some things that we can learn from these interactions that Jesus had around the meal? I think the first thing well, it starts with this. We should start inviting somebody. Invite somebody. Whether it be, hey, I'm at my workplace, and I know everybody at workplace gets a break at 12 o'clock to eat lunch. Or I know, hey, there's a routine that everybody uh, eats dinner. Did you know that in most cities in America, or maybe most recently, everybody eats dinner at night? I mean, everybody in your neighborhood could be eating the dinner at the exact same time. Wow. 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 So it's an easy opportunity for us then to be live sent. Hey, I know my neighbor's eating dinner at 9 o'clock. I'm going to eat dinner at 9 o'clock with my neighbor. Mm -hmm. I, I, hey, you know, I've got a, a, a backyard with, and I have some grills. Like I, I found out, uh, or was minded recently, I have charcoal grills in, the back, in my backyard and I can get a couple people from my apartment complex at a meal and we can gather them together. Invite somebody. Luke chapter 5 is this, is this reminder that, that dinner was for everybody. And, and Luke chapter 14, verse 12, that's the, the verse we're talking about. Don't, you don't have to worry about inviting people that will repay you. Though sometimes I know I get that way. Sometimes I'm like, I know if I invite this person over, they're going to invite me over, and I'm going to get a really good uh, culture meal, uh, usually. Anyway, uh, so, you know, my Chinese friend, or my I love that food. Man. It's, it's so much better than hamburger and hot dogs. I don't know. We've got, we've got, to, we've got to change what we eat. But anyway, um... <laughs> But don't, don't think about, hey, how are they going to repay me? Or, or hey, uh, who they are and what their status is. Hey, invite somebody. Start with one. Start with one neighbor. We have a neighbor down the hall, and, and for the last couple of weeks we've been thinking about this. One person down the hall, we see him every day when he goes to work. Uh, it's an elderly couple uh, from Nigeria, and, and he has a walker, so he always goes, and the badger bus comes and picks him up. And so we, we've talked to him many times over the, uh, in the hallways or as he's getting on the bus, and I'm like, man, we, we've got to have a meal with him. That's somebody that God has highlighted to us. Think about it. Pray, hey, who is it that God's saying, highlight that one person? Start with one where, hey, they're going to have a meal this evening. I'm going to have a meal. Let's have a meal together. Start there as a demonstration of the gospel. Maybe you don't know your neighbor's name. Start with one. No, get to know your neighbor's name. Uh, maybe you've never met the cubicle next to you at work. Uh, get to know their name. Uh, start with one person. Anybody. Start with someone. Last week we said we should say something. This week we said start with one. Invite someone to dinner. And then two, we should lower our expectations. The Pharisees, one thing they had against them, they had such high expectation, nobody can eat with them. Nobody can share a meal. Nobody can come near them because, hey, I got so high expectation that my standard for who I can invite is, is limited to, a, to the, a couple names. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Let's look at that for a second. Now, verse 26 is verse 21. 
to this. The servant came back and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered the servant to go out quickly to the streets, the alleys, and the town, bring the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Sir, the servant said, what orders have been done? The master told the servant, go out the road to the country lanes, to compel them, compel them to come in so that my house will be full. He said, man, just go grab anybody. When's the last time that we just grabbed anybody and said, you know what, I got something to share with you. Let's, let's come have a meal. They, they come and, and, and this meal, again, remember, meal is, is inviting people into friendship, into who we are. And so when we invite them into our home, and it's a, it's, that's a hard place, because right? Like sometimes our, our home is guarded, and, and, but sometimes we've got to even lower our expectations, and that goes for our home. Sometimes it's hard for me to invite somebody in my home because I know it's not set perfectly. Anybody else have a perfect house, right? you got to have everything in order. you got to have everything uh, put in place. And, and if, it isn't, if it isn't put in place, then you're profusely apologizing because things are a little out of order. And sometimes, sometimes those things about ourselves, our culture, guards us from actually interacting with those who are around us. Oh, I, I, I haven't mastered this cooking thing yet, so I'll, I only know how to make... Of macaroni and cheese, uh, Chef Boyardee, you know, so I can't invite, you know, we used to tell our college students, man, it don't matter what, what you can make, invite somebody in, share a meal with them, because that begins a friendship. I mean, the best times is when I get to go and eat barbecue ribs with my friends. You know, you know when you eat that messy food, you know, you've you got to that level of friendship where you can invite somebody to see you slurp and slop, right? <laughs> <laughs> they go and eat barbecue ribs, get the big old barbecue ribs, and you don't be messy. That's the, that's the kind of thing we're inviting people in. You, you know you only do that with certain people. Hey, allow that gardenness to come down a little bit. I, I love it when I get to eat with some of my Chinese friends. The first time I ate with, with Hao uh, was, a, was a cultural experience. But I, you know, I know in, in my home growing up, right, we weren't supposed to slurp noodles, right, or anything, like when you're eating food, like you hear the sound, right, it's, a, it's not a, a great sound to hear, and the first time I ate with my friends, I came into their, their living room, and they made some soup, and they made some noodles, and different things, and it was like a slurp fest, where it did, and the whole, the whole time, it was, a, it, was a, it was an experience, and we got to know each other, and I was like, at, when I first heard the sound, I almost like, <laughs> and I ran to inside, like, oh, that wasn't, oh, I wasn't supposed to do that. But he was just being himself, and I was staying with him. And we were able to connect on a level, right? Sometimes we've got to lower our expectation. What we, we find normal or what we find satisfying in order to build a bridge of friendship so that the gospel can go forth. Because when I ask, so, hey, what kind, of, what kind of cultural things, what kind of personality things do I have that is causing me not to allow people into my life? And, and hopefully... We see that Jesus demonstrated that no matter what the cultural norm was, he was able, he was willing to cross it for the sake of meeting somebody, for the sake, the sake of sharing good news with somebody. Right? May we join him in that? As we go on this journey as a church to be a people that are living sent, we're inviting people, we're inviting you to eat meals with people. That's what today is all about. Eat meals with people. Start summer. And so today, out in the foyer as we exit, there's a sign up and it's a live scent and it says start with one. And I want you guys to go by and, and to consider who's the one that I want to start with. Is God asking me to, to meet my neighbor? Maybe it starts with just getting to know their name. That might be that might be a good first step. Get to know their name before you just, hey, come over for dinner at my house, right? <laughs> and, and in some settings, so it works. In, in my apartment complex, I could probably do that. I would say to my neighbor, hey, come over for dinner. They'd be like, yeah, sure, free food, let's do it, right? So so think about it. But but it may start with on that on that board outside is different cars, and they have different ideas where you could start. Maybe it is you say, yeah, I can. I think I can be challenged, and one of them says, <coughs> eat a meal with a coworker. Have a break with a coworker. Maybe it is get to know the neighbor's name. Maybe it is making cookies. You know, the, I, I think most people love chocolate chip cookies. I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I've met a person that doesn't like chocolate cookies. Make a dozen cookies, and one of them is uh, take the cookies to your neighbor. Uh, and, and let's challenge ourselves to start with one. If we're going to live sent, live people like Jesus, his disciples were known as people that ate and drank, they, they had a good time around meals. Let's join in that. 
Let's follow that lead. Let's be obedient and begin to share meals with those with one another and with our community. Because this will open opportunities for us to then share the gospel. There's one more thing that we're starting. Not only is it, hey, uh, hey, one thing, start with one, but we want to start celebrating what we're doing as a body. You know, we're all living life, maybe we see each other once a week, maybe we get an opportunity to see each other twice a week or something of that nature. But, but we're all doing different things to share, the, share Jesus with other people. And so if we could post that, that slide up, uh, we're, we want to start celebrating on Sunday morning what we're doing, so that we can start seeing, hey, oh, we, we, we're doing something. The, the, the gospel is going forth in Madison. We, we are sharing the love of God with other people. We are sharing the love of God with our neighbors and those kind of things. So we're starting this um, plus one, easy plus one. So next week when we gather together, uh, not only is my good friend Todd Lucas going to be here from Chicago, we get to hear what God's doing there. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be encouraging. But we're also going to celebrate what we've done this week to help tip the scale of love. And so and there's a friend that there's missionaries in the Middle East. And they were trying, they were a little struggling to, to be encouraged about the mission that they're on. They're, they're in the Middle East, it's hard, you know, to, to see fruit. It's a, it's a hard labor, they're trying to convince people to follow Jesus. And so they started keeping track that they're becoming discouraged and God reminded them, hey, be encouraged. And, and so they started keeping track of every moment, every interaction that they had with unbelievers. They started to, to keep track of, of a cup of tea that they had, a conversation over a meal, an act of service that they did for, for a neighbor. They, they started to keep track of, of a smile that somebody gave instead of the, the, the hard look that, somebody, that people would usually give. And they, they kept track of that. And in their journal, they said, they, every time something like that happened, they had a meal, they had an interaction, they had a positive uh, friendship, they had a, a good handshake, they had an active service, they, they put plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. And they hoped, and their hope was, and their prayer was, that all of these plus ones would add up. And then eventually, it would tip the scale towards meaningful gospel transformation in their community. And, and the good report is that as missionaries continued to add up and continue to add up, they saw that the, the same people that they saw over and over again, and the same interactions they had over and over again, and eventually they started to see people come into Christ. And they showed the love of God in these simple, ordinary ways. And so remember, the church would love to, to highlight the specialized things, the preaching, the worship, but it's the ordinary things that Jesus invites us into to make a difference, to live sent lives. And so we're starting this. We set up a text message, 797979. And so this week we want to encourage you. This, doesn't, this is random. It doesn't show who you are. It doesn't go to anybody. It just goes to a, a church site. So we can start adding up our plus ones. Those moments that we had an interaction. Those moments that we talked to our neighbor. Those moments that we made an effort to have somebody over for a meal. And so we want to encourage you. Text message in. Hey, 7979, seven, seven, easy, plus one. And it's going to keep a record. So next week we come together, we can celebrate. Hey, this week, 12 people were impacted. 12 people uh, made an effort to share the gospel with somebody. 12 people had something. And we're going to continue to celebrate this as we go until we see that, hey, the city and the areas around us are impacted with the gospel because we're living sin. And we get to celebrate that. It's important, I believe, to celebrate as a church what God is doing among us. Amen? This morning, I want to also have a meal with you. Pastor, I would like to invite you in, and Linda, you come and take the elements. And like I said, in the book of Luke, uh, in the book of Luke, there was many meals. Jesus was either at a meal, going to a meal, coming from a meal. And in Luke chapter 24, it records an amazing meal. The Last Supper, this meal that Jesus has with his, with his disciples, and they had prepared a room together, they, they got up in the whole room, and Jesus takes two elbows, two parts of the meal. And before this, Jesus, Jesus said to his disciples, he said that they had to eat his flesh and, and drink his blood. And you know, at that moment, it was a really big decision moment. It was another one of those theological things people got upset about. They said, 
isn't it wrong for us to eat your flesh and drink your blood? Like that was that was something they were asking to do that was really like inappropriate for them to do. And at that point, it says that many of his disciples went away. They, they decided, you know what, that, that, that costs too much. To, to identify with you in that kind of way, it, that's too much of a cost. And then others of his disciples, they, they said, and Jesus turns to them and asks them, um, do you guys want to leave too? Are, are you guys done with me also? Are you, are you going to abandon me? And his disciples made this powerful statement. They said, uh, who else would we go to? For nobody else has the words of life. I don't need it. And so, at the Last Supper, he again brings out the bread and the wine. So I want to read this together.
about why they couldn't respond to the invitation. They had work to do. They just got married. They were too busy. But there were many from far off that said, yes, I am compelled to come and have a relationship with this master, with Jesus. So if that's you this morning, you say, yes, today I want to make a decision to follow Jesus. I want to make a decision to enter into a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to count to three. And when I get to the number three, I just want to invite you to, to raise your hand. And as you raise your hand, as a, as a sign to Jesus saying, yes, I accept the invitation. Yes, I accept the forgiveness you've given me. Yes, I want to make you the Lord, the ruler of my life. And in this moment, he invites, and in that moment that you make that decision, he invites you into fellowship. He invites you into friendship. He invites you into his body. I want to count to three. When I get to three, I want you, if you say, yes, I, I accept that invitation. I want you to raise your hand without a shadow of a doubt. Yes, Jesus, I accept the invitation to follow you. Are you guys ready for that? Ready? One, two, and when I get to three, you can raise your hand and say, yes, I'm entering into that relationship with you. So ready? One, two, three. If that's you. Raise your hand and say, yes, I accept this invitation. I accept the invitation into a relationship with you, God. I thank you, God. In this moment, you can even begin to pray. God, I thank you that you have accepted me into a relationship. There's people that are raising their hands all over the room. So I want to just, I, I want to celebrate. Can we celebrate the decision to enter into a relationship with Jesus? Thank you. This is, this is an important moment in your life to say, yes, I am entering into a relationship with Jesus. And so at that moment, Jesus makes a, a statement, and he gives thanks for the body that was broken. This wafer, this piece of bread, is a representation of God's body that was broken. So in a moment, I want to pray, and we're going to partake together. And I want to thank God that his body was broken. It says that his body was broken for our healing, for our restoration. Let's pray together. Thank you for that. Father, I am so grateful. We are so grateful. That Jesus, you humbled yourself. That you became nothing on our behalf. That you withstood blows. That you withstood whips. That you withstood the pulling off of your beard, the piercing of your crown. Your body was broken on our behalf. And Father, this morning we say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus that whoever in this room that has brokenness in their body, Father, that as we take this element, album representing your broken body, Father, that we would receive the healing that our bodies are in need of. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And they all work together. He also took the cup and he said that this cup is a representation of my blood. The blood at this moment was about to be shed. And when it was shed, it was a, it was a covering for all of the sins. This blood is amazing because it makes the Isaiah prophecy about a later banquet where all people of all nations, of all faces, <coughs> it made it possible to be happy this blood, because now we've been forgiven and we can enter in a full relationship with the Holy Father, with one that is pure. So let's pray a prayer of thanksgiving for the blood that was shed. Jesus, precious Lord, Savior of the whole world, we thank you this morning. We thank you this morning that this gathering, at this moment, was possible. That the good news that our sins, which caused a separation <coughs> from our Holy Father, have now been covered, have now been washed away. Jesus, we thank you for your blood this morning. We thank you that it was shed to make it possible that all nations, all people, all faces, can come together around your banquet table 
to receive forgiveness, to receive grace and mercy. So, Father, as we partake, God, I pray, Father, that you would continue the cleansing in our lives. That we would continue to look more and more like you. Father, forgive us from areas in our lives that we fall short of your glory, short of your character. May your blood always be a reminder that we are forgiven. That guilt has been washed away. That shame has been taken care of. And that now we are called your sons and your daughters. Father, we thank you that all these promises are held in this cup. Your blood shed for us. We thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. We all put it together. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you have united us as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm grateful that God has, is leading us in the direction to be part of His mission. That, that we have a part. I hope you guys are getting excited about that. As we talk about being lived in, we have a part in His master plan. Ordinary people, eating lunch with people, sharing our story, can bring kingdom impact to those who are around us. So today, I want to invite you, if, if you are a new at Cap City Church, or maybe you've never been to an all-in course before, downstairs, we're having a lunch, and we're going to be talking about the mission and the vision of Cap City Church, and how we can play a part in the future of God's kingdom expanding. We believe that we are a multicultural expression of God's kingdom, and He wants to continue that work here. So if you've never been to an all-in course, maybe you've been part of Cap City Church for years, but you've never been uh, uh, to an all-in course, or you're new in the last few months, and you say, yeah, I, I'm committing myself to the future of, this, of the church. Uh, we want to be joined downstairs in about 10 more minutes. But uh, before you leave today, please make time to, to go by the board to pick one of those off. Start with one thing, one simple thing, and we'll see how this all adds up to seeing other people come to know Jesus. And if you're new here this morning and you have a connection card, I want to encourage you to get, put that in the box behind or, or see Tammy afterward to give those connect cards because we want to connect with you. We want to make sure you find a place that you can call home. So God bless you guys and I want to pray over our week. Father, we thank you that you've done good things. Father, as we go as your sent people, Father, I pray that we would make a difference in the lives of those around us. Father, and I pray a blessing on every family, every child, every spouse, Father, Lord, every single here. Father, Lord, I pray, God, that we would experience your closeness and your nearness as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I pray you all would be blessed.